is John Conley. I'm the program coordinator for tonight's lecture and uh, a member of the um, Watershed Edu Education Series Committee. It wasn't all that many years ago, if we wanted to take pictures, we had one choice using a film camera. We could choose print or slide film with up to 36 exposures per roll and a choice of film speeds. Back then, unless you were a pro or a very serious amateur, we tended to use our cameras mostly at family events or celebrations or when we were on vacation. One of the biggest hassles back then was sending the film away for processing. Remember that? That meant driving to a drugstore or photo kiosk or using a mailing envelope. It usually took several days to get your pictures back. Though we tended to be very careful in taking our pictures, we sure didn't want to waste film. We were often very unhappy with what we got back. And maybe we only got a handful of images on that roll worth putting in an album. Then came the digital revolution. A whole range of digital point and shoot and SLR cameras sprang up overnight. On an inexpensive memory card, we could literally take thousands of pictures and any images we didn't like, we could simply erase, giving us back room for more pictures. An equally huge revolution came when cell phones came out with decent quality digital cameras built right in. That meant we'd always have our camera with us in our pocket or purse. We've invited Carl Hannafin, a Canisius Laker with a lifelong interest in photography to share with us some photography basics and many useful tips that can help us take better, more interesting images and to get the most out of our digital devices. When the idea for this lecture was decided last fall, Rich Engelbrecht was to be the presenter. Sadly, he passed away in January. Carl, who was a longtime friend of Rich's and a member of the same camera club, kindly volunteered to do the presentation in his stead. Without any further ado, Carl Hannafin. Thanks. Remember. You, I think I bumped it, Carl. Oh, <laughs> you took me. Um, I you accidentally take me? bumped the screen. Can you take me somewhere. Let's see. <laughs> I have no clue where I am in the presentation. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's see. I can tell. I can tell. I bumped it. But I didn't yeah. Hey, hey. Yeah. there we go. Good. No, I need to get to the. Oh, oh right. here's the. Here, uh, here run that. There you go. Okay, I'm back oriented. So now you want to make it full screen. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Just from the beginning. Yep. There we go. Okay, good. Sorry about that. So, uh, so in, in alphabetical order, I think, I, I, with Rich first, because uh, to, just to remember Rich, uh, who was one of the most um, giving people in terms of, in, of helping others with photography I ever knew. He loved to help people with photography. So. Uh, Listen, first, we got John and I kindly contributed some images here. So some of them are, are there, some are mine, and some are Paul's. And Paul's here taking photos tonight. So I uh, may see more from him in the future. Uh, oh, Stack, you've done it. If only we had a camera. But of course, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the far side is always a good, good place to start. <clears throat> Rule number one, have your camera. I've never produced a decent shot without one. Uh, th that's true. And it used to be a big deal uh, because you'd have to carry around you know, something that you didn't normally carry around. But now, of course, you have cell phones and everybody has a cell phone. 
and they always have a camera with them. So, and they take surprisingly good, actually surprisingly, they take really very good uh, images. They do have some limitations and they have some uh, areas where they excel. Each of these three cameras out here are, are a little bit different. And uh, tonight I wanna to talk a little bit about the differences. And then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some particular ways you can use your, your cell phone camera to, to get better images. So basic camera, you have a subject, you have a lens and a shutter, which focuses the image of the subject onto a sensor. And the shutter controls how long it's exposed for and therefore how much light goes in. So that's just the basic terminology. The big difference between, let's say these three cameras, or any of these cameras and the cell phone camera, is the size of the image. So the size of the, of the chip that actually re, uh, records the image on which the image is focused dictates a tremendous amount about the performance of the camera, uh, everything else being more or less the same. The technology behind the sensors, all the same. They're all either CCD or CMOS. Some of them are backside illuminated, some are front side, but those details don't matter too much because they're using the same production process for the cell cameras as they are for, for the expensive uh, professional level cameras. So the, the big difference, the full frame would be a, would have a sensor the size of an, uh, an old style 35 millimeter slide or 35 millimeter negative. That's a, that's a full frame camera like the, the big one on the tripod on the end. Uh, the, uh, this camera, this little, little point and shoot, has a slightly smaller uh, imager. It's about um, roughly half the size uh, width and height wise, which means it's about a quarter of, this, of the area. Uh, I know the camera Paul's using is the four thirds camera. It's a four thirds camera, so a little smaller than the, than the, uh, than the full frame. And one of the things this affects is, is size. You'll notice the camera he's using is very convenient size, actually. I really like it a lot. Uh, it weighs a lot less. This thing is pretty heavy. It's only carried around for a very long And it costs a little bit less. And the cell phone cameras are, are free with a cell phone, basically. <laughs> they do have some different characteristics when it comes to using uh, the, the cameras to take images. And one of the big differences I went too far, one of the big differences is what we call depth of field. So the smaller the imager, the greater the depth of field. So when I talk about depth of field, I'm saying uh, how much of the, of the range of distances from the camera are in focus or in an acceptable focus. So I took a picture uh, with, a, with a pretty wide open lens, which will give me a narrow, excuse me, we call narrow depth of field of a book. And you can see how the, these lines are out of focus, this line's in focus, and these lines are out of focus. So I'm looking at the book kind of at an angle, sort of like if the book was on the table and shooting down across. So the, the ones at the top are further away from the camera, the ones in the middle are right at focus, and the ones at the bottom are closer. If I have a smaller imager, or I make a smaller aperture, smaller opening where the shutter is, I can get more of that same image in focus at the same at one time. Small imagers give you very high depth of field in general. And cell phone cameras also have usually pretty wide open lenses, which also gives you great depth of field. So, it's not necessarily a disadvantage. It doesn't make it a, a, a worse camera or for that matter, a better camera, but it does change a little bit what you can use the camera for or what it's really good at. So um, here's an example where you don't want too much depth of field. And I took this picture of this bird in my, in my house and you can see details behind it that are sort of distracting. It doesn't, doesn't emphasize the bird much. 
if I use the camera with the narrow depth of field, I can isolate the bird and really make it stand out in the, in the image. So you can use narrow depth of field to your advantage if you want to avoid a distracting background, which is often what you want to do. So this is a, a situation where uh, a cell phone camera probably is not the best choice. Sometimes you have too, too little depth of field. This is my niece and her husband. Uh, and I, I focused on my niece and I had a narrow depth of field, F2 8G, so a wide open lens, it's a very narrow depth of field. And you can see uh, he's out of focus a little bit. If I stop down, I can increase that depth of field and get them both in focus because he's standing a little further, just a little bit further away from the camera than she is. So you can have too little depth of field. One trick before I go too far with this, is some of the, the cell phones these days have uh, a portrait mode. Do they have an iPhone? Do you have a portrait mode? Have you used your portrait mode? Yeah, it works pretty well. It's pretty neat. What the, the portrait mode does, this is my dog. This is a, a, a standard picture from, the, from this cell phone to iPhone 10, I think. Uh, X, X, I think, or XS. And um, you can see that there's distracting details to catch your eye behind. It doesn't like the dog very much. If you take the picture in portrait mode, it takes the image and it, it figures out, it's smart, figures out, here's the subject, the dog is the subject, and it, it blurs using a, a using code on the program, on the phone, it blurs the background. So the subject tends to stand out more. Not that you can't tell that there's a chair there, but because it's out of focus, it distracts you less. Mm -hmm. It's not as, as apparent to you, so it's less distracting. A little, little bit better picture. Works very well uh, in a limited kind of way. It's a little bit of a cheat, but hey, it works. <laughs> cell phones are really good at macro photography, close up photographs, because one problem with macro photography is the depth of field is generally so narrow that you, you can't get the whole flower in focus. In this, in this excellent image, there are in you know, varying distances uh, flower. That, uh, it's all pretty sharp, nice, nicely, nicely done. What everything's all in focus. So, if you have a situation where you really want to have a lot of depth of field, cell phone cameras are great. They're they're much better, in fact, than some of the some of the other the, the better, more expensive cameras. Better. Cameras. So. It's kind of a characteristic of, of cell phone cameras that they have a great depth of field. And you should keep that in mind when you're taking pictures with a cell phone camera. Here's a, here's a, a deep shot. I call it a deep shot because here you have a background that you, you don't want to eliminate. I mean, you've got the sky plane and the bagpipes and the great castle behind them. And you know, you really want all that that environment included in your in your image. And the only thing I didn't like about this image is this white thing. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of bothered me a little oh, bit. Oh. <laughs> so I decided that maybe the white thing. Should be <laughs> and it's a much better image, don't you say? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this this is a great image. You know, you, I had to cheat a little bit. I had to do some Photoshop work on that to get rid of the white thing. It just took me a couple minutes. Um, and if you look closely, you can tell it was done pretty easily. But, but it's a great cell phone shot. Nice, the sky is pretty good. And a good depth of field, nice background. So deep shots with a cell phone camera are awesome. Cell phone cameras also have, uh, have modes like many of these cameras do. One of them is a panorama mode, which is not to be forgotten about. Panorama mode, especially if you live on the lake, Fourth of July, Fourth of July, you, you know, you got to have it. Everybody has to have a shot like this, you know, where you have a picture of the, the ring of fire. Uh, awesome use of a, a panorama mode. The only thing about a panorama mode you want to be careful about is 
because as you pan across the tenor, which you do, start from one side, press the button, and you move across. Because as you pan across, it's taking different pictures and then it's going to merge them all together. If you have a fast moving person or object, or boat, perhaps, you can actually get a picture of that boat here and then again over here. And over here. And if the boat, maybe it's not such a big deal, but if the person, you know, if the same person will be in multiple places. And that's a little spooky. <laughs> you do need to be careful about, about panorama mode with moving objects because you, you can get you can get parts of legs hanging out and stuff. Just, uh, not a good thing. But uh, here's a nice day shot with panorama. Um, don't know too much about this shot because it, it looks it's really well exposed all the way across. So it's very uh, evenly lit all the way across. I'm not sure if it was post-processed or what, but it's a, it's a great panorama of the light. And, um, you know, one thing I just wanted to mention about panorama is sometimes it's hard to figure out which, how you're going to use a panorama. But if, uh, if you use a panorama for like a heading, if you, you know, if you imagine that you had like a, a brochure or, or, or even a letter that you wanted to send, here's a letter from Canisius Lake, you put that at the top and you, know, you write underneath, it's just a great way to use the panorama, just right across the top of, of the paper. So um, sometimes panoramas are a little bit awkward because they're so wide and so, so short, but there's a, there's a good way to use them. So keep that in mind as you use panoramas. Um, this is a panorama. This is a panorama. Oops, went too far. That, this is a panorama from the sky. And we, we use this to, to uh, keep track of the weeds. So it's, it's a panorama uh, from a drone. It actually wasn't used, wasn't made using a panorama mode because it, it doesn't really have a panorama mode that moves along the shore like this. But what it, what it was is a series of photographs. You can almost see lines here where they where I merged them together. Uh, so it's actually a series of, of photographs merged together as a panorama. Uh, done manually. But this, so there's other reasons you might want to use a panorama. Cell phone cameras also have filters. I, I just I needed to make a profile picture and I didn't want to use a regular profile picture. So I, I made I use a filter. I thought it was pretty cool looking. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of options. You can you can have like Shrek Shrek uh, horns coming out and all kinds of things. So, <laughs> ask anyone under 25 more about this. I, I, I don't use filters an awful lot, but I know there's there's countless apps that have filters. And there's and within those countless apps, there's countless filters. So there's many, many options. And, and that can make some of your imagery interesting, fun. But the biggest thing I think about taking images is what I call composition. And this is universal for any, any of these cameras, these, these ideas about composition. So the goal here is to give you some ideas that you can look for in your images and images of others, and not necessarily follow any of these rules, but just keep them in mind. Maybe they apply, maybe they don't. And we'll see some examples of that. My daughter is, is a painter. She, she, she does a lot of paint. She's doing pretty well at it. And when I think about painting, it's kind of about what you put on the on the paper, right? It's, you take paint and draw whatever you want to draw. Uh, for me, it wouldn't be very good. Uh, photography is is about what you can keep out of the, the image. Usually, it's usually about, in, in my mind keeping the distracting elements that are always there from being a problem, uh, from distracting from the focus of your, of your picture, the, the object or objects of your picture. So consider starting with the background as, as, a, as a starting <coughs> place to look and working forward. So what's in the background that's going to be distracting for the, you know, for the viewer when they ultimately look at the, pic at the picture? So this is one, one process that you might go through as you think about composing an image. 
Another thing you want to keep in mind, the pictures versus the eye. When I look around the scene, let's say, let's say start with the picture. When we, we take a picture, we capture a period of time. It's a very short period of time usually, but not always. A short period of time, we have this complete scene and we freeze it, boom, that's it, no changes. We have the Photoshop. <laughs> Fundamentally, it's a static image, the whole thing. When you look at a scene and move your eye around, your eyes constantly adjust. They adjust focus, they adjust to the different lighting conditions. Uh, they even adjust to different colors. And in between your eye and your brain, you integrate this, <coughs> this information into a, an image in your, in your brain. Uh, which corrects for all these little details of focus and, and color, and lighting, and so forth. So if I look at the scene right now, I mean, I just got bright things up here that sometimes give me halos with my glasses. I got some bright lights in the background. But yeah, I can see the people in the front here who are not well lit, except for you know, the screen reflecting off. Because my eye adjusts. But that doesn't happen in, in, a, in a photograph. None of that adjustment takes place. So we have to keep that in mind too, as we think about composing an image, because everything that you capture in that image is going to be there when when you, you finally you know, print it or use it somehow. And um, all my rules, there are no rules. They're guidelines. They're, they're just ideas. So so don't get too hung up on on um, rules as something that you must do or must follow. You know, we break the rules all the time. Uh, before we get talking about the rules, there's, there is an important idea here. Keeping the camera still and holding it still or using a tripod if you can, is, um, is really makes a big difference. Uh, it makes a big difference for two reasons. One is the shutter is open for some period of time. And if you're like me, you move around a little bit, and, and you're holding it still. And for the period of time that it's open, if you move, everything's going to be blurred, smeared a little bit on your on your, uh, your image. It's bright light outside in the sunshine. That's probably not a problem because it's going to be so fast that even a little bit of motion is not going to hurt. But if you have a big, you know, long telephoto lens or you're we use and some of the new phones have these telephoto modes. If you have uh, use doing a telephoto mode on your phone, a little bit of motion in your hand is going to translate into a fair amount of motion with that telephoto lens. So we think about if you're using binoculars. You, know, you move binoculars just a little bit, everything kind of jitters. So that's true with with cameras as well. I, I wanted to. So let's tell you a story about this little cell phone tripod. By the way, these are pretty, they're really inexpensive. In, in little tripod, you can set it down, you take your cell phone out, and you find the camera on the back, and you flip it in here. And then now you can take a picture, and you don't have to worry about it being it moving around. But there is one little caveat. And that is, if you press the power button and the volume down button at the same time and hold it for long enough, you will be dialing 911. <laughs> <laughs> I did this. I did it on my bicycle, actually. I had a, a, a cell phone holder on my bike. So be careful about using, uh, it'll give you a warning usually, but if you're on your bicycle and you're, you're driving through Lakeville, you may not hear that warning. And, um, so just be careful about that. Don't don't get this, the power button and the volume down button at the same time. But you can set the camera down and take a picture. If it's an Apple, you can use an Apple iPhone. And it's, it's got this great camera remote. You can see the image. I can see the people in front of me. And I can take a picture. Really, it's pretty cool. Uh, if you're at a party and you wanted to get a picture at a Christmas party, you set this up on the mantel somewhere. You do that, you can see, make sure everybody's in it. Press it. It's really, really quite, quite neat. And, and a lot of people have these iPhones and the watches are more popular now. So anyway, 
Uh, think of a way to keep it, keep the camera still. You can use a tripod, you can use a monopod. This is, uh, there's only one leg. And, uh, you know, if you're on the sideline of a football game, which I've done a little bit of, you, uh, you want to use a monopod. <laughs> you sometimes have to get out of the way in a hurry. And uh, this is a lot easier to move. A lot, a lot of times, in a lot of places, parks and so forth, they won't, uh, they, they will frown upon you using a tripod just because it kind of gets in the way of people. Monopod is usually a lot more acceptable. It's a lot easier to move around with, but it isn't quite as steady. So, but it's a, it's a way to do it. You can lean your camera on a railing, or you can stand next to a tree. I do this a lot of times with these small cameras. I'm walking around sometimes with a small camera. I'll lean up against the tree. You just put a lean the camera against the tree and take a picture. It, it makes a difference. Now, it makes a difference because it keeps the camera from moving around. But when you use a tripod or you, you fix your camera someplace, you pay more attention to what's on the screen. You just, you're more conscious of what you're doing. And um, so you're less likely to miss things because you have more time to see how everything's composed. So it, there's, a, there's a physical difference, which is the camera doesn't move very much. And then there's this mental activity difference. And I think it's profound. Uh, you look at the screen differently when you're using a tripod because you don't have to think about holding it. You're not worried about how long you're going to be up. Your arms don't get tired or whatever. Uh, a lot easier to use a tripod uh, and, and uh, study the image before you actually hit the button. Just think about that. Uh, particularly important for low light shots uh, because of because the, the shutter is open for a longer period of time. And and you know, like I just said, it helps you examine your shot and notice issues. And that's, that's, a, that's a really big deal. Okay, so some, some guidelines. This is my personal pet peeve. And I got this great image and I ruined it to, just for, to illustrate the point. Start by uh, straightening your photograph. You know, the, uh, cameras, or, or I'm sorry, cell phones have basic editing tools and, and some not so basic editing tools as well, but they all include the ability to straighten the photograph. And if you're a Laker like me, it's pretty easy to straighten the photograph by looking at the water. <laughs> this is flat, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, sometimes if you look at, at the, you know, the shore from a, at an angle, it seems to go a different way. But just look at trees, you know, they're growing up or telephone poles that are going up and down or the sides of windows, all, all kinds of clues to what's up and down. Uh, straight in the photographs. It, it's very easy to do, and it's a great place to start. So that one, that's almost a rule, <laughs> but still a guideline. So uh, this one is probably the most, uh, the most common rule that people have heard of and used is the rule of thirds. And and this is an excellent image. I don't know who took this picture. This is a fantastic picture. I really love this picture. Um, wish I had a copy grid on it. But the grid it helps me illustrate the rule of thirds. If you, if you think of your frame like this is you looking through your viewfinder or you're looking at the back of your cell phone, if you divide the, the area into thirds, having your subject at a point here or here or here or here will give you a more appealing image. Not necessarily a balanced image, but it'll give you a more appealing image if you, if you let they say, bullseye the, 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 the target, it, put them right in dead center. It's less interesting. I don't know why, but this is well known, and, and, and you'll, you notice, if you look at pictures that you like and pictures that you don't like, you may notice that the ones that have the subject off to a, a either along, along the line of a third, or located at these third points uh, make a big difference. There's a lot of other things about this image uh, that we'll get to that I like, and we'll come back and, and look at this image again and, and, and after we talk about a few things. But rule of thirds is a pretty good, um, pretty good rule. Here's, a, here's an image of uh, a soccer player. And I don't have a great way to illustrate this, but maybe you just imagine that, that 
person right in the center of the picture, it'd somehow be less interesting, wouldn't it? Now you know where the ball's going to go. <laughs> it's, not, it's really neat. Interesting idea. State rule of thirds. What happened? Oh, I had some stuff in there. Oh, you're showing up. You cleaned up the background. I cleaned up the background. Yeah, I cheated. That's good. Yeah, let me, I'll show you. What I, yeah, you can see what I took out. I forgot I had that in there. Um, here's another uh, little starfish. And, you know, it doesn't really matter what you take a picture of, but here, I guess I must like the lower right hand, you know, third point. It may be my personal preference, but you can kind of see what's the object of that picture is, is clear. It's the starfish. And um, it's the primary object in, in right along that, that third line. Uh, here's a, this is another uh, good photograph I ruined. I think I, I think I also said it um, to make your vote the, the third, third point. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, I think it looks better here because it's, it's not right dead center. It also gives some place for this buoy that is otherwise just a little distracting to really be. So I think it, I think it works a little better myself. Um, here's another thing to look for. What are called leading lines, and this is, you know, this is Seattle, right? So, um, you know, you just see the tower, the, the lines just sort of draw your eye right up. So, leading lines are great because they can pull you into a, a section of the photograph uh, where. where the interesting part of the image is. It's all kind of interesting, but those lines is a good, good place to, to look. Here's, here's another leading line. No question what the object of the photograph is, but the, the leading lines to give you a story in your, in your mind to how that person got there, what, what they're going to do, what their, what their objective is. It's kind of interesting way to, to do it. Sometimes leading lines lead away. This is, a, this is a photograph of uh, this tremendously straight section of railroad track in Peru. And um, what, I, what I, like, I like about it is that the motion that you see here is, and yet often the distance things are nice and clear, and the knuckle, I think this is called the knuckle, but the train um, is, is, is sharp and kind of interesting. Leaning lines are kind of leaning you away, but so. Directing you a little. So how do you do that on your camera settings to get the, uh, the blurry just up front? You need, you, what you need to do with this is um, there's railing on the back of the train. <laughs> you hold your camera against the railing yeah. and you let the shutter speed go for a long. So there are, now there are ways to do that with a cell phone. Um, if you have um, some cell phones have more controls than others for the, the photograph. And if you expose uh, this image, I maybe was. Exposed for a fifteenth of a second, I'm going to guess that will be enough time that the, that the objects that are closer will have moved uh, will have moved in in the view. The, the angular position of these objects will be more spread out in the fifteenth of a second than these because they're further away. Right? They're, they're going to appear to move less, which is why. It looks like you're moving down here more than it does up there. But um, so you, you have to you play around with it a little bit. But I, I, I was crouching down, leaning against the railing, using it as my tripod, because I didn't have a tripod on the, the hand you know, with me, I guess. Um, would have been better, probably, with a tripod. <laughs> but and, and because this part of the train is connected to the railing, it didn't move. <clears throat> Okay, um, here's another thing to look for. And this one is real obvious, right? framing. Uh, this is actually a mirror, so not a picture, it's not a hole in the wall. The mirror, and uh, you know, it has well, literally a frame uh, that is around the object. And there's ways to do this artificially, like this one. Uh, you can, a lot, a lot of times you'll see pictures through windows, which are, are um, for, you know, artificial framing. 
way to frame it. But there's, there's also natural framing. Uh, so you can use trees as a, uh, as a, as a frame. That's a very common sort of approach to things. Um, also, that adds step to the picture, too. Yeah. You yeah. stop in the foreground and then. Yeah, because you get the sense that if the other side of the lake is much further or further away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. My camera is calling. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like Dick Tracy. <laughs> There's a few other things I wanted to mention about this image. Just to be lines here. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're fake. <laughs> this line doesn't line up with that line. You might sometimes you get artifacts from the from the camera that look a little like this. We'll see some later on. I think these ones maybe were put in. And I think the moon. This is one photograph, and the rest is another photograph. <laughs> because when you have the moon so bright, that's part of the poem or something. But anyway, we have the moon so bright, and the rest of the, the area not so bright, you exceed the range of values that the camera can, can record. That your eye, this, this is kind of the way you, met, you remember looking at the moon, maybe, um, because your eye adjusts. Your eye will, will, will find this darker section, and, and it'll, the pupil will dilate, and your light vision will kick in, whatever. And uh, you'll, you'll adjust dynamically as you look around the scene. That doesn't happen with a, with a new take picture. Here's more framing, natural framing, right? So we use some rocks along a little bit blurry, blurry vegetation. And then some people like that framing in focus. I, I'm not worried about that so much. I think the the color and the context gives you, as John said, gives you the depth, put your eye where it wants you to be. And the heck with the rule of thirds. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, you have to use your imagination to think about this one, I think. This is balance. And this is vertical balance. That was what I'm thinking about with this image. If this rock, just imagine this rock were just open water, and you had that big rock behind the boat, but not in front, nothing in front of the boat, it would feel heavy behind, just dark and heavy behind the boat. Whereas I think if you have the rock in front of the boat and behind the boat, it sort of balances that image for you. And um, it's not a rule, it's a guideline. But when you take a look at your pictures and you, if you use a critical eye to evaluate your own images, consider that maybe balancing the photo will help. Uh, so this, this, this is another one where balance, I think, comes into play. Uh, up in the Adirondack, maybe a fisherman. That rock sort of, you know, kind of keeps you from tipping over when you're looking at this picture. Otherwise, you're sort of wondering what. I mean, it's just I, I think I think balance is an important part of it. If you have something heavy on one side, have something heavy on the other side. Probably one of the hardest ones to to uh, to to deal with, in my mind, is is this idea. It's a fairly common idea. Spirals, and I, I, they're hard to find, and they're hard to Put your finger on mostly because it keeps moving. But if, imagine this spiral, you know, there's kind of like this spiral image here. Some are better than others. This is not a great one uh, as far as spirals go, but it does kind of, you know, spiral through in terms of the theme of that image. This one is much more, much more a spiral kind of image. Um, I, I really like this. Image. The only thing I, I find, not to be hypercritical, but uh, this, these folks here, they're kind of the subject, but they're not well lit and they're not looking at the camera. And that's unfortunate. It'd be better if they were. If they were looking up, it'd be great. Yeah. Well, like, next time, you know, wherever that is. Uh, here's the spirals. Uh, 
the progress makes the spiral over there. And uh, the, the color of this image was terrible. Don't forget that you can convert the image to black and white. And sometimes the image is just a much more appealing image in black and white because the colors help you balance. And, and so you show off the spirals better. Uh, it's kind of a nostalgic look. So mm -hmm. black and white can help a lot. The other thing that you can do that I think is evident in this photograph is you look critically. The corner is a little darker than the center. The vignette. So if you do a, a very subtle vignette, it tends to bring the focus to the center of the image, which is probably better than, than having too much focus on the edge of the corners of the image. So consider black and white and don't forget about vignetting. Again, that, that's stuff you can do in your in your basic editors. Like, and it's all about light, right? So it's light direction is kind of interesting. Um, this is in Vermont, right? looking at the sunset in Vermont over Lake Champlain. As the sun goes down, you get the sun just gorgeous over the, over the Adirondack Mountains. It's a beautiful area, and, and it's great to look at. But but if, if um, I was there one time, and there's a couple that wanted their picture taken at, at this this spot, it was very, right at the waterfront in Burlington, very popular in the sunsets, and, and they they wanted to have their picture taken with the sun sunset right behind them. And I said to them, I'll make a deal with you. I'll take your picture looking this way. If you let me take your picture looking this way in a minute, <laughs> and they were they were good, 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 good. but we did this. You couldn't see their face at all because this is too bright and their face was just too dark. Too much range of light dominance. So out, out of the ability of the camera to do it. Now, if I had had a flash, I could have filled in their faces a little bit. The uh, problem is it would have been bright white light and there's yellow light coming back at me, so it might not have worked. But um, at least you would have been able to see their face. But when we turned them around, this great golden glow behind made just the most fantastic image on their face and the catch light in their eyes. And it just, it worked, it worked really well. So sometimes you want to be looking at the sunset, but if you're taking a picture of somebody and the, the sunset is behind them, you're, you're not going to see them. <laughs> you, they're going to be, it's a white lighthouse. <laughs> you, they're going to be very dark. I guess so, unless you want to specifically want a silhouette or something. Oh. Why would you want a silver? Uh, yeah. yeah, you might want a silver. Um, this image you can catch easily with the saucer because you got a great depth of field. Not so bad. You can, you can do that one. This image might be a little tricky because the only lighting is the three candles. So, um, diff diff very different approaches to the way light is, is used. Uh, but having limited light is a great way to to um, to take pictures because there's, the, the distracting balloons don't matter. I mean, they actually tell you more it's birthday party. So uh, this was a school play. If you ever take pictures of a school play, go to rehearsal <laughs> because because during dress rehearsal you can go anywhere. They don't care if you distract the actors. It's the actors' fault. During the show, <laughs> if you distract the actors, they're not happy with you. <laughs> but silhouettes, you know, that, that was, that's me being uh, the Jolly Green Giant, I think. <laughs> um, the flash behind me, it was, it was a fun shot for uh, showing lighting. Silhouettes, sometimes you, you want that. It's kind of a cool thing to do. Here's another guideline, and then we'll, we'll, we'll review something. Leave space to move. Now, this is hard to do with this inject. I, I, I love, I love this moonshot. It's a great moonshot. Um, moonshots, when the moon is not full, probably better than when the moon is full. Everybody wants the full moon, but the full moon is is too flat. When when the moon is not full, you see these shadows of the craters right along the edge. And much, it's much more interesting. 
when you crop this image, don't target it. Get it off center. If the moon wants to go that way, I feel like it. Uh, get it room to go. If you wanted to go this edge, I don't know. But give it gives it space to go one way or the other. Don't pin it in. I told you we we're going to come back to this image. What does this image have that we've talked about so far? God rule of thirds. What was that? It's got leading it's lines. Great, the great depth of this. It's got great leading lines. It's got great leading lines. Right here. We just talked about it. Where's she going? She's going over here. It gives you room to move. The room to move. It's got great room to move. Fantastic room to move. And think about the lighting. This is not an accident, folks. See how bright it is down here? That brings your eye. Over. Here's our subject. We know that. Where is she going? She going up there where the light is. So you know exactly where this person is going. You can almost hear her walk from from here to there. It's just it's fantastic. Um, what about balance? You know, we talked about balance before. We got this dark thing here. It's not. It's a, it's a building. It's kind of looking building, but there's not a lot of detail in it because it's dark. And there's about the heavy dark one over there. But they're okay because they're balanced. And they're not distracting because they're not bright. So it's fantastic. It's a great image. I like it. So what do I think? Rule of thirds, of course. Leading lines, we got that one. Balance, we got that one. Lighting, we got that. Space to move. Doesn't have a spiral. Doesn't need one. Um, a bunch of the things. This is a redheads. I know uh, Rich is a great fan of redheads. And, but, uh, this is one of his images. And, um, the, how, many, how many birds do we have here? We don't know. Right? Because it seems to go on forever. But if you back out a little bit, probably to here, you'd run out of birds. Um, but here, it's like the sky's the limit. When you have a bunch of things, don't you know? Don't back out so that you get to the end. Crop so that there's they seem to be into it. It's a much more interesting shot. Um, uh, here's kayaks. Oh man, look at all those colors. It must be a thousand kayaks. I, they were trying for a, a Guinness World Book of Records. Uh, on Seneca Lake, gathering of kayaks. They weren't even close. But here, it looks like they meant it in, 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 in Orion, at least. Uh, they didn't have nearly enough parking. It's the thousands. They didn't quite get there. But it's, a, it's a kind of neat. And, and again, there could be lots more. Who knows? So if you have a bunch of things, crop, crop is such that you don't get to the end. It just... Lens flare and other facts. Just thought we should talk about it a little bit. Um, some people object to these, and some people think they're cool. <laughs> but if you look at this image right here, you see a little kind of a green spot, and here's the green spot. What, what's happening is the light is entering the camera lens from, from this direction. It's hitting a, a lens somewhere in the middle. And it's reflecting off of that lens to another lens that's already gone through, and then reflecting back to the image. And I don't know which one of the various lenses it's bouncing off of, but it's bouncing back and forth inside the lens system. And what you're seeing, this dot here and this dot here, what they call lens flare, is reflect, internal reflections of lenses. <laughs> and there's not much you can do about them in, in, when you shoot. You can, you can fairly easily take that out in Photoshop if you care to. Uh, I actually don't mind it too much. It's sort of part of the game. But uh, some people, in, in some cases, you, they're distracting by taking them out. And so there's, there's that artifact. And then we talked about these before, these, these lights coming up. The, what happens in some cameras, most cameras that there's aperture that shrinks down. You've all you've kind of seen them on the big 
a bunch of blades that kind of rotate in and make the, make the opening small. And where those blades, as it gets really small, they, call, they cause the diffraction problem. That's a fancy physics or interesting physics. The diffraction is really important. It's way late then. It's when it gets, it passes it's all up. And what happens is you, you can get these, these resulting rays that come off of a bright spot because of this diffraction, the way these waves pass the, uh, the, the closing aperture. Sometimes when you make a really small aperture, especially with stars or the moon or something, it, 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 can, be, it can be stunning. It looks like, um, it looks like a, like a, a you know, star with points and all that. Um, but it can either be something you like a lot or something you don't like. If you don't like it a lot, you're going to have to probably get a camera that doesn't do too much of that uh, by having rounder blades. They can avoid this a little bit. And um, by not shut, closing down the aperture, and leaving the aperture open, it gives you less depth of field, but you, you can avoid some of these rays. Or you can correct them in Photoshop, which will take a long time because it's a pain in the neck. Um, some artifacts like that you can't do too much about. But th th this particular, this, this rays are so popular with people that some of those filters I've seen, they have rays that will automatically make stars out of everything. In fact, I think there's kids' glasses you can get for parties that do the same thing. Just a couple words about software, uh, because this comes up quite a bit. And, and uh, I wanted to mention uh, Lightroom and Photoshop. These, th this company, Adobe, probably, probably has the lead, leaders in, in uh, so, so much of the leaders in this d domain that, you know, just to Photoshop something has become a verb. It's actually a product. Uh, it's this software for editing images. And it's fairly expensive. So um, there's a, another product called Photoshop Elements. Yeah, I put it in blue. Okay. You can use the like, great idea. I, I never use it. I use like, Lightroom Photoshop, sorry. Um, Elements is it, consider, consider uh, uh, getting a copy. It's, uh, um, you might get a kickback, but I don't get a kickback from them, so I can say this. So it's 69 bucks, didn't you say? Yeah. Like that? Yeah, pretty inexpensive for, for software of this sort. It's an organizer and an editor and has probably 80% the capability of Photoshop at you know, a fraction of the cost. So it's something to consider. Adobe Elements. Uh, ACDC is, is one that's very popular and very fast. Uh, Pixlr is free. It's one of many free editors, but it's, it's a free online editing system. It works reasonably well. Not, not, not bad to, to do. Um, it's a whole bunch of others. And, and don't forget about, in terms of organizing, the photo app on your on your iPhone. I don't know about the Androids anymore. It's been a while since I used an Android phone. The photo app is really good at organizing. And I don't know how it does it, but it, every once in a while, it, it sends me a video, like a, a, a slideshow. It's got music on it, and it's got, like, the birthday party that we were just at, or, or some canoe trip or something. And this has got all the great pictures in there and music to boot. And you don't have to do anything to make that happen. It's pretty cool. I don't know how they do that. Have you ever used GIMP? Uh, I've tried GIMP because it's free, right? It's the open source uh, photo editor. Yeah, yeah I, I understand it's pretty good. Um, I, I never really got too serious about it just because. I, um, I'm a little concerned, I, I was concerned, so less concerned now, but open source software for a long time had a reputation of being a little buggy and well behind, and it was just worth it to me to just always have something I saw that I could stand on with Adobe products. And now I'm like addicted. I can't, I mean, I can't get off Lightroom. It just, it would be, it would be a problem for me. Um, but GIMP is probably a good choice because most of that open source stuff's been around long enough that it's pretty solid. But I haven't. I'm not. I'm not a user. Does it have an organizer? Do you know? I don't. I don't recall. I, I just. I just wondered. But you can do. You know. You can do everything. You can do layers. And yeah. Yeah. It's all the Photoshop stuff. Yeah. Yes. 
maybe not as, it's not as polished yeah. as, as Photoshop, but pretty much anything that you can do in Photoshop, you can do. And then there's a lot of free tutorials online. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. It's GIMP, right? Yeah. 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 GIMP. So if you're interested in it, in, um, there's no no kickback involved, right? <laughs> it's all free. But, uh, so let's see. Do I want to talk about this much? I want, I want to say just a couple words about this dynamic range limitation. Time, okay. Um, you can go the other side. Yeah, I want to I want to keep it. I don't want to bore people here. Um, <laughs> dynamic range limitation. So. The dynamic range refers to how much, how many different light levels a camera can deal with from lowest to highest. Uh, and there's no camera or printer that can match the human eye in terms of range of, of light levels it can deal with. Uh, and the, the eye has the advantage that it moves and adjusts as it goes. <laughs> so not only does it have a better range than the camera, it, it uses that range more intelligently. In the photos we talked about before, frozen and colored. Whether you printed them or you put them on a screen, whatever you've done, they're frozen. Uh, I guess videos aren't exactly, but, they, but in a sense, they really are too, because the video is just a picture and a picture and a picture and a picture. Every one of those photos. This means that for some situations, there'll be either pure black or pure white, or both, recorded for your image. This is not appealing because you'll lose detail. If you can avoid this, it can be helpful. Um, this is a, another one of those images where it's been cheated. There's no doubt that if this full moon were over the lake, and you expose this with any camera made today, uh, correctly for the moon, you wouldn't get any detail in the, in the hills. If you expose it for the hills, the moon would be pure white, and you wouldn't see any of the, the detail of the moon. It wouldn't look like you remember. So what you can do is take two photographs and merge them together, put the moon visible here on, from the photograph that the moon was exposed correctly for, and the hills where the hills were exposed correctly for. And you can actually do this pretty much automatically these days with GIMP or Photoshop or Photoshop Elements. Uh, you can uh, put these Im put images together and make uh, high dynamic range imaging. So I made these cool graphs. I told you I took physics, so um, you got to have graphs if you teach physics. If you, if you think about this axis being the amount of light hitting the center from one to four, right? I don't know what units, it's one to four. Uh, and this is the, the response of the sensor from zero to 100%. Here. So between, in our, in our arbitrary case here, Less than two, I'm saying, is going to be registered on the sensor as zero because it's not enough light. Then there's a range where as you increase the light, the sensor responds. And it goes up to 50% in about two and a half. By the time we get to three in our, in our, in our scale here, when we get to three, is that 100%, which means it's pure white. So here is just, just black with a little bit of gray. This is Pure white. And from here on, it's pure white. So you lost the, the, the moon detail, all white. Hills, black. Water, the sky, you got some detail. That's one exposure. You can make another exposure where the moon is in this active area. So what we've done, we've either shut down the aperture made it smaller, or made the, the shutter open for less time. Less light gets in, the moon looks full. Okay, another image, the moon's good. You take a third image. Should I go backwards or forwards? Take a third image, and we got the hills now. So you got these three different images. You put them together algorithmically, and you can you can imagine how you can put those three images together and make one continuous image that comes out and looks like well, that's not the moon. <laughs> that's not what I did with that other image, so I couldn't really show it. But um, this is, has the same idea. We've got one correctly shown for the sun, one for the, maybe the detail here in the, in the dark trees, and one for the truck in the zebra. This is the point over here during the concert, one light 
And uh, these rays are not an artifact of, of the uh, camera. There are shadows of the tree. But this is a high dynamic range image. It, it, you see a lot of these this, images these days where people have uh, blown uh, you know, the range way out. Some of them look uh, sort of real. This looks almost like you could believe that it, it, it happened. Um, and sort of the way you remembered it, some of them look like, how bad. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not a great fan of HDR, but uh, sometimes this high dynamic range can, can be used pretty well. So in order to take that, your camera is on a tripod, and you take three consecutive pictures. Yes, or as many as you, as you want. Or, well, minimum three. Yeah, yeah right. right, minimum three. OK. And then you only can put them back together with using like a phone. Photoshop or GIMP or yeah, Elements or one of those. Some cameras have an HDR mode and they actually do it and then combine it in the camera. You're correct. That's not a, not a cell phone, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good, well, well, well taken point. Yes, the HDR is now such a common thing that cameras do it automatically for you. But again, if you're hand holding that series, it becomes problematic because you, you could be moving between the shots. Oh, yeah, right. So you have to be a little careful. If you're this far away from things, not such a problem. I'm not sure exactly what was done with respect to the waves. Um, maybe it may be that they were just exposed well enough in one of those images that, that, that Photoshop or I just use one one image for that space. It sometimes does that kind of thing. Uh, oh, la last time, other things. Uh, Join a photo club. Think about a photo club, and um, it, especially a photo club that has competitions. They're, they're kind of fun, and they get you to be a very critical viewer of your own images. Because when you look at an image that you took uh, at you know, um, the sunset, you remember what a beautiful day it was, how warm it was, and the dinner you had afterwards, and the fantastic ice cream that you ate. And it all comes back to you, and you think, this is the best image, and you know, it's going to win first. And, and then the, 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 uh, <laughs> the judges look at it and say, you know, that tree is out of focus, and what's that dog doing there? You know, I mean, <laughs> and, um, and they're right. <laughs> From a photography point of view, you, you look at it and say, oh, it's not so, so good. So um, do, having somebody else evaluate your images is, is really uh, humbling and enlightening at the same time. Uh, this is another. Free online, I just pixelary.com. I mentioned it before. Uh, it's a little bit like GIMP, but some company has sponsored it. And uh, this is uh, my, one of my preferred uh, source for equipment information. If you're interested in it, DP stands for Digital Photography Review. DPReview.com is pretty good. And I don't get a kickback from them either, darn it. <laughs> Thank you for being patient and listening. <laughs> Any questions I can answer? Probably many, um, and th that's fine. Uh, because I, when I, I've done this course, this, this actually came from like a three or four week course I used to do the library for several hours or over three weeks of homework and tests and everything. <laughs> uh, so th there's probably a lot of unanswered questions. That's why you need to join a photo book. Really helps a lot. Has there ever been a photo club here at Kenesha Slate for people that have yeah. here? You can start with that. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be one that went in Genesee. Yeah, yeah, it's been a little while since the Genesee Photo Society, the Genesee Valley Photo Society. It's been a 